We've put together today, um, not just as, as Jubilee, but um, with a coalition of organisations uh, like War on Want, World Development Movement, Trade Justice Movement, Tax Justice Network. And we're, we're working together for the next um, three years to really look at the fact that the world is in such acute crisis and look at the role we as campaign organisations play and try and challenge ourselves to do things a bit differently. And rather than coming and simply saying, this is our latest campaign, please sign a postcard, please get involved in it. Actually, how can we work with activists around the country, some of whom will be working on global issues, some of whom will be working on domestic issues, some of whom will be working on environmental issues, um, and say, how can we work together to really challenge um, a system that has brought such incredible suffering and poverty to so many people. So hopefully we've got all sorts of um, creative and innovative ways of thinking about the economy and how we can control the economy um, and regain our democratic right, our democratic need to control the economy in the interests of everybody in the world. So today is supposed to be really as participative as possible, but we're going to start with a little bit um, of, a, of a lecture, if you like, putting forward our view on how we can tie together the financial crisis um, that's taken hold of this part of the world with the big global crisis um, that so many of us have been um, working on for such a long time. And I just want to start with a question. You are very free to shout out answers. Don't worry about putting your hand up. Does anyone want to um, proffer an answer to the question, what is the economy? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Sorry, I didn't hear that first one. The Life, the universe, and everything. Gross <laughs> <laughs> domestic product, yeah, that's something that. I would like to say a system that has come in by accident rather than by design. <laughs> it's a source of social organisation. Yeah. So that's kind of. A form of social organisation, yeah. So one of the things I'm, we're trying to get across in the project that I'm going to talk about today is to stop trying to think of the economy as something that's over there and that a group of scientists, uh, if you like, called economists, um, tell us about and translate and interpret for us and tell us, well, if we do this, then this automatically happens. And rather to think of the economy as simply how we organise our society, how we relate to each other, um, mediated through through money in, in, in the case of our economy at the moment. And what I want to do is some of what I'm going to say is, is probably a little bit technical. Some will know the issues well, others um, probably won't. And we can have questions about that at the end. But I, will, I, re I really want to try and move us away from trying to understand what a credit default swap is or what a coll collateralized debt obligation is. Because I don't think we need to understand those things in order to, un in order to have a, a, a view, a valid view about the economy that should be taken into account by, um, by politicians when they make economic decisions and make economic policy supposedly on our behalf. And I think that unless we do that, it's going to be very difficult for us to regain control of our economy. And frankly, if we don't have any control over our economy, I would argue we don't really have a democracy because the economy is about the way we live. It's about decisions at all different levels of society, how we relate to one another um, in a society, in our communities. Um, and I think the way that it's been turned into a kind of science or pseudoscience, I would say, has in many ways removed our ability to influence these very, very fundamental things about our society and the world we live in. So first of all, I'm, I've got 10 minutes to describe how we got here, which is challenging um, and has to be very broad. And as I say, some of this might be technical, some of it will be familiar, some of it won't be. We can, we can come back to it. But I want to argue there's two really big reasons behind the economic crash that we're experiencing now that for 30 years now have been, exp have been um, experienced by um, the third world, as we used to call it, the developing world, the global south. And, and much of what they've been through in the last 30 years is, is kind of coming home to roost in a way and is being seen in, seen in Europe. So I do want to just spend 10 minutes going through the kind of history of that. Um, you may disagree with bits that I say, and we'll have a chance to talk about that at the end and hopefully throughout the rest of the day. 
because this is, this is our view of, of what's happening and we want to try to make, the, to, to, to discuss this view with others and see how they, what their perspective of it is so that we can actually come to an understanding together of how we got here and without that it's going to be very difficult to change it. So first of all, not surprising given where I come from, I'm going to start by talking about the debt crisis, two big drivers for in the late 1970s that drove a very new way, a very new form of economic thinking and ended the kind of economy that we had post-war in the 1950s and 1960s with this kind of with, with, with um, fast growing economies where wealth was um, shared. There was a compromise, if you like, between labor and the people and capital, the people that, that, that controlled industry and finance and so on to, to share wealth in a way that hadn't really been seen before and to use the government, the state, very centrally to try and control the economy. And this started falling apart in the 1970s and there were two drivers for this. And the first driver was the debt crisis which is what my organization, Jubilee, worked on. And I, I won't go into great detail about how the debt crisis happened. I'm happy to answer questions. We've got tons of materials, and there are many people in the room who are, who are expert on that. Um, but essentially what happened in the 1970s was the United States found itself in a profound economic crisis. It had massively overspent on the Vietnam War um, and on general social programs, massively overspent. And it sought to push this crisis onto the rest of the world. To retain the power, the hegemony it has over the world, it sought to export the crisis, if you like. And one of the ways it did this was to make the dollar the world currency, to delink the dollar from gold, and to say the dollar is now the basis of, um, internet, of many international transactions, like transactions in oil, um, and is the, world, is, 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 is the value by which all other currencies are judged. And by doing that, no matter how much the debt the, the debt the US got into, and we all know, I think, probably that the US is in a horrendous amount of debt, no matter how much debt it got into, it doesn't really matter because people would always want to buy dollars. Essentially, the rest of the world would always want to buy US debt. And so that was one of the ways that the US formed the kind of economy that it, that it has today, where, where it has a debt which in it, for any other country in the world would be absolutely disastrous, um, but it actually gets by and keeps functioning and is still you know, in, in the richest country in the world. And the second way was it lent money out. And it lent money out to the third world, especially to newly, uh, newly countries newly emerging from, um, uh, from, from colonialism. And this was done by US banks mainly, also Western European banks, but particularly in dollars, because there was an oversupply of dollars in the 1970s, and these were lent out so that banks could, could profit, could make money. Um, they lent them out at reasonable rates of interest at that time, but they weren't too interested in who they were lending them to. So they were lent in many cases to dictatorial regimes. They were lent in many cases so that third world countries would have the money to buy our goods and to support our manufacturing base. And then what happened at the end of the 1970s, when the crisis in the West got even worse and we had raising un rising unemployment and rising inflation at the same time, the banks wanted to protect their, themselves from inflation, from the inflation, that, the high levels of inflation in their economy, and they did this by raising interest rates. And by raising interest rates, that meant all the money that they'd lent out to third world countries suddenly became extremely difficult to repay, when countries that had been paying um, money at very low rates of interest were suddenly um, forced to pay 20, 25% interest. And in 1982, uh, Mexico defaulted on its debts, and this sent a shockwave through the financial system and um, there was a belief that all of Latin America was going to default on its debts if Mexico defaulted. And so um, the, the financiers got together with governments and they said, what are we going to do about this? I know, let's lend them more money. Let's lend them more money so they can pay off the debts today. And that got them through today, but tomorrow the debts were even bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the debts kept rising. And to be honest, they haven't, they haven't stopped rising since that time. And what happened was big institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank came in and made these new loans and essentially bailed out the banks, the private banks like Lloyds, Barclays, TSB, Citibank, all sorts of high street banks here in, in, in the United States were bailed out by enormous loans from the IMF to these countries so they could repay their debts. And the debt kept rising and rising and rising and being recycled. Um, and it was a crucial way that sovereignty was undermined for a great, a great part of the world. So that's one of the big drivers that created the economy we've got today. And the other was the rise of a new economic doctrine that was tied in with this called neoliberalism. 
or some people call it free market fundamentalism, which I, I kind of disagree with, and we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute, but a new economic philosophy that had been dreamt up um, by a group of, especially Milton Friedman, who here is getting a prize from Ronald Reagan, who'd been working away in a university in Chicago um, from the 1950s onwards on a completely different way of thinking about economics. And this way of thinking about economics didn't involve the state. It involved the state getting out of the economy and allowing people to, allowing companies and individuals to make as much money as they felt able to make. The state should leave people alone, leave the, leave the economy to, um, to commercial actors, essentially. Uh, get rid of the, of the welfare state, because that removes all sorts of in incentives. Privatise things, the state shouldn't own things. And, and it really sees people as kind of atomised individuals, as at what people do, people are essentially economic decision makers, and they're faced with a load of choices, and they make their choice through where they spend their money. And they almost saw that as the perfect way for democracy to operate, through money and spending money. And it, it, it was, they, were, they were very influenced by Ayn Rand. I don't know if people have, have heard of Ayn Rand. She's becoming very big again in the United States now, who wrote this book called Atlas Shrugged, which is almost kind of how, how greed and selfishness are good and will create the good economy in the end. These choices, these rational choices by people will, will kind of create an economy where, um, where everything that everybody wants is, is provided. And, and this, this form of economy, which was very, very heretical at the time, was initially pushed on Chile when, the, um, when Salvador Allende was overthrown in Chile in 1973 with the help of the CIA and, and this man, uh, General Pinochet, came to power. It was, it was seen as a kind of petri dish, a testing ground for this economic philosophy. And it was pushed on this, on this country at a time of shock. And Naomi, Naomi Klein, in her book, The Shock Doctrine, a few years ago, says the thing about this economic philosophy is it always uses crises in order to be pushed onto society, when people are, are most defenseless, if you like. And it was tried in Chile and, and then tried in, in many other countries. Um, and tried in many other countries, the crisis that was experienced by many countries allowed this way of economic thinking to come in was the debt crisis for many countries. The fact that simply countries were now under the tutelage of the International Monetary Fund, that essentially they didn't make their own economic policies anymore. The International Monetary Fund made their policies to, for them and handed it out and said, we'll keep your economy going, we'll keep giving you the loans, you keep repaying the banks, but in order to do that, you must follow this economic um, philosophy. So debt was used as a way of pushing um, what, as I say, was called the free market, but, but, but actually I, I think it's a, a misnomer to call it a free market philosophy because actually what it's encouraged, as we've seen, is the growth of absolutely enormous transnational corporations um, that have more power than countries. And it's difficult to really see how there can be any kind of free market competition, I believe, um, with, with, those, with, with, with that, that, that kind of power. But also these corporations very often depended on the state actually in order to subsidize what they were doing and, and, and corporate welfare certainly didn't go down in this period despite, despite what people like Milton Friedman um, thought and believed in. And governments all over the world were forced to change their laws not to meet the needs of their people or do what the people wanted but in order to meet the needs of the creditors and the financiers and the, uh, uh, expressed through the International Monetary Fund. Um, and they talked of trickle down. This is how it was supposed to work. It's okay to make, give people, get, allow people at the top to make a lot of money because people at the bottom will benefit. And this is a rather nice cartoon, I think, that shows actually the champagne stops when it gets about one layer um, from the top and never actually reaches um, people at the bottom. And we saw that, that happening again and again. And, and, and what developed was really what I think the Occupy movement has um, really well described and summed up as an economy for the 1%. Since the 1970s, the 1% became enormously wealthy. While for the, for the majority of people, what characterized this new global economy was, I think, three things. First of all, massive inequality. Uh, secondly, uh, periodic crises that economies and countries would go through. 
and the real volatility that governed the lives of ordinary people because all of a sudden their food, which, for, for example, let's take the example of food, which previously had been subsidised by the government, there'd, there'd been um, food put into storage in case there was a crisis, farmers had been given access to fertiliser for free, all of this stuff had been, prices had been kept at a, at a level that people could afford by the state. All that was ripped away and all of a sudden whether I can get food or not depends on the price of food on the international market. So incredible volatility came into people's lives. And finally, I think undermining democracy. Um, because clearly, when your country is being told what to do by its creditors, rather than um, by you as, as citizens, as people of that, of, of that country, um, that's going to have a massive impact on, on democracy. In the, in the mid-1970s, Many developing countries came together in the non-aligned movement. They came together before that. But in the 1970s, the non-aligned movement, people who weren't pro-Soviet bloc and weren't pro-US uh, Western Europe bloc, got together as the non-aligned movement and said, we want a very different kind of economy. In 1974-75, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution saying we need a new international economic order. And that new international economic order actually looks like, um, you know, the kind of manifesto that we as charities would come out with today, we as campaign groups would come out with today, calling for radical changes in the way trade operates, radical changes in the way finance operates, um, more power to commodity pr producers, all sorts of interesting ways of restructuring the economy. And the United States and Western leaders looked at this and said, this, this cannot happen. And that's when the G8, with G8 coming to London next, ne next year, the G8 was formed as the G6 as a direct response to what was happening in the UN and the power of these countries. And there was no doubt about it, um, discussions between corporations and heads of countries in the West who feared for their position in the world, who said, we need to undermine this. And one of the key ways that the sovereignty of those countries was undermined was through debt. Um, uh, which allowed this, this whole economic philosophy to be rolled out over the world. Um, and we had this kind of greed is good thing, I suppose. There's the 1980s for you. <laughs> Some people might, might remember it differently. Um, so, um, but one of the main things that we've come back to again today is lots of talk, talk about austerity in our own part of the world today. But actually, austerity is not a new thing. Austerity was exactly the program that was pushed on countries across the world, Africa, Latin America and Asia, um, that, 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 was the, that was the condition of them getting these new loans, of them keeping, keeping going. And really, the austerity agenda is, is, is more or less here. First of all, you cut government spending, health, education and development. Secondly, you, and, and, the, and the reason for that was you're in debt, right? You're in debt, so you can't spend, so stop spending. Uh, then you privatize. If you privatize stuff that you own, you're going to make some money from that. Then you can repay your debts with that. Thirdly, liberalize your trade, because then you'll encourage cheaper items. Uh, you know, this is all based on the whole philosophy of competitive advantage. You make items where they can be made cheapest, and, then you, and, and that will allow everybody to access cheaper goods. So liberalize your trade, and then stuff that's been made in somewhere where it can be made cheaper will come in, and you'll have cheaper food in your country. And then liberalize money, liberalize your capital account, they, they call it in the, in, in the technical term. It means free up your banks, allow money to come in and out more freely, don't impose any controls on money flowing in and out of your economy. And that will be good because it, allow, it will allow investors to come in and these investors will help you um, to build your economy. Well, it didn't quite work like that. Because what actually happened when you, do, when you did all of these things, well, first of all, um, you remove any kind of independent sovereign economic policy from the country. <laughs> Your industries and services that p people had previously relied on and your economy had relied upon to keep functioning and growing is all of a sudden in private hands and operated for profit and can relocate and renationalize because you've, you've liberalized your, your, your money so stuff can just leave your country whenever. Um, in many cases, domestic industries and agriculture was utterly destroyed, wiped out by the fact that all of a sudden, yes, cheaper food was coming in, but that meant your farmers couldn't compete anymore. So all of a sudden, you're dependent on food coming in um, from um, somewhere else where it's been subsidized by the American government or Western European uh, uh, governments. And all of a sudden, you have no food self-sufficiency and you're totally dependent on the international um, market. And finally, you have absolutely no control over finance. So yes, investors can come into your economy and invest, set up a business there or whatever, but they're not paying any tax because you've given them that as an incentive. They can re repatriate all of their profits back to the banks in the West when they finished. And many of them are simply speculating. They're putting money in and out without any real interest in the development of your industry. And so as a result of this philosophy, 
in the 1980s and 90s, 54 countries went backwards in terms of human development indicators. And that's stuff like, um, you know, literacy, the amount of people who can read and write in, in a society, the age people live to. Um, uh, those, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen unless you have a terrible calamity or a civil war or a war with another nation. But in the 1980s and 90s, it happened because of economic policies that were forced on countries. And I want to um, now focus a little bit on how this affected the West, because this also presented this economic policy, some challenges for, for us here in the West as well. It wasn't, conf it wasn't confined to the third world. And one of those problems um, that, that, that emerged was actually inequality, trickle down. This trickle down theory didn't work. Just to give you some US figures, because they're easier to come by, um, since 1980, um, the, the, the amount of the economy controlled by the 1% in, in assets and income and so on rose from 80%, 8%, sorry, to 22% in 2005. That's the 1% that, that Occupy and so on talk about. The amount of the economy they controlled went up hugely. And um, the, meanwhile, most people in the economy either stayed the same, their income stayed the same as the, the amount of the economy controlled at the top was, was growing, or they even got worse. The, poor, the poorer off got worse in society. So how th this is a problem for an economy, because if most people are getting proportionally worse off. How do, you, how do you keep your economy going? How do you keep people buying the stuff that you need them to buy in order to keep the economy going? Well, you say to the banks, give people more credit, create more debt. And that's exactly what happens. So again, household indebtedness during this period in the US doubled, except for the 5%, because the 5% at the top were the people who'd earned an incredible amount of extra money that they could now lend out to the people at the bottom to make even more money. And to, and, and to make inequality go up even more. By the way, uh, this happened, in the, in, especially in the run-up to 2007, the crash here. It also happened in the run-up to 1929, in the 1920s, before the Great Depression. So it's not a, it's not a new phenomenon that, 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 um, that that's how inequality works. And it's compounded because those at the top tend to spend less money on productive activity and more money on um, assets. You know, they buy houses and drive up the price of houses and yachts and paintings and, and those kind of things. Um, I mean, the housing thing's really interesting, probably for people here, but certainly from, you know, I live in London. House prices are incredible because they've been driven up so high. But this, doesn't, this, this also benefits the people that own the houses because then they um, can rent them back to the poorer part of society and make money through that as well. Um, and, and also speculation. I mean, there's just a lot of money sloshing around the global economy all of a sudden, uh, looking for somewhere to make money. And if you can't make that much money from investing in a factory and building something and doing something productive, then um, invest it through a hedge fund in a kind of um, more risky financial instrument. Um, and this is where the credit default swaps and, and so on emerged from, invest it in a, in a derivative based on food somewhere along the line, but you know, you've never actually bought the food, you've bought a right to buy the food or something like that, Some, something uh, crazy, and that will make you much more money, you'll get a much bigger return on that. Uh, I don't know how many people, if you've, if you've got any money in the bank, you're earning an interest today, but I'm guessing it's not so much. Um, if you look at what the, the top 1% are earning through hedge fund investments and so on, well, I mean, they, they, they wouldn't get out of bed for anything below 25, 30% on their investments. There are investments in China and emerging economies in Africa and so on at the moment that are making 200, 300%. So this is the economy today, um, post crash. Um, the economy becomes a giant casino. There we go, there's a casino. Um, and this isn't just a thing in the West. Um, around the world, income differentials are also widening. Inequality is also going up. More than 80% of people in the world today live in countries where income differentials are widening. We've had that one already. Um, the poorest 40% of people uh, on the planet account for only 5% of income. The richest 20% account for 75% of world income. Uh, and that's, it's, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. The richest 500 people in the world have more income than the poorest 416 million people. Uh, even the International Monetary Fund um, said at Davos at the beginning of last year, the increase in inequality is the most serious challenge for the world. I don't think the world is paying enough attention. The Financial Times, the Financial Times, which kind of really tells the truth because the people who read the Financial Times really need to know what's honestly going on in the world because they need to make sound investments, um, says, I did a whole um, 
supplement called Capitalism in Crisis a few months ago. And the beginning, of the first article in this supplement talked about inequality. Inequality means capitalism is eating itself. You know, there are real concerns for the sustainability of capitalism by the Financial Times because these differentials are so enormous. So again, just to reiterate, we have this economy, this global economy, characterized, I believe, by inequality, crisis and volatility, and, and, a, and a lack of democracy. So two more um, sections. First of all, the crisis hits home. As I said at the beginning, the, ch the chickens have come home to roost in some ways. Um, but the scary thing is how politicians in Europe today are pursuing exactly the same economic policies in response to a crisis, a debt crisis, that was pursued 30 years ago in Latin America, 25 years ago in Africa, 15 years ago in Southeast Asia, and hasn't worked in any of these cases, or has it? Because you have to really come to the point where you look at the policies being pursued by institutions like the European Bank and uh, the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund and say, they're not stupid people. So is austerity working for the people who are actually conducting these policies? Um, we've been told that we all party and we must all pay the price and we must forego therefore cuts. But as we've seen from the inequality figures, that really isn't true. We haven't all partied. Some people in our own societies haven't done very well um, out of um, the economy that was developed in the last 30 years. And the only people who've done really well are a very, very small um, number of people at the very top. Today, we're gonna, we've got um, a couple of people with us in workshops later, um, Christina from Greece and Yolanda from Spain, who are going to talk to us about what's happening in their societies, probably the two countries in Europe where austerity is really hitting the hardest. But just to give you some headline figures, and it's interesting for a group like mine, which has worked for 15 years now on third world poverty, that we are also starting to think about countries in our own continent. Um, here's some scenes when we talk about undermining democracy, here's some scenes from Greece as um, the Greek parliament decides to pass its latest austerity budget a couple of months ago. Um, I was watching on the live stream on The Guardian one night and you literally could not see the main square in Athens because the tear gas had completely covered it as they were discussing this bill. They used water cannon on protesters for the first time since the dictatorship. So it's very serious and you know, many people in Greece say, can you call that a democratic decision if you have to really enforce these kind of conditions in order for Parliament to be able to make a decision? Horrendous, horrendous, oh, horrendous figures. Youth unemployment over 55% in Greece. Massive rise in the rate of murder, suicide and HIV rates. Free healthcare becoming a thing of the past. Cancer, many stories of cancer patients and people going into, store, into hospital to give birth and it's not free and you can't leave hospital or get any treatment until you pay for your medicines. And I think most scarily, given our history in Europe, um, an openly Nazi party um, simply controls areas of Athens. And I was in Florence a couple of weeks ago with some friends from the Greek debt campaign, and they told me stories, and I read the papers and watch this stuff, but I mean, to be honest, they told me stories that left me absolutely speechless about how they had been seriously beaten up by the police as completely normal protesters, peaceful, not armed. Um, at how them as campaigners, but also immigrants, um, people who are a different colour, um, gay people, anyone who looks different in society is now at threat of, Nats of Nazi gangs who patrol the streets in Athens and uh, have, uh, have free reign, aren't controlled by the police. Um, this party, Golden Dawn, is now, in, according to opinion polls, the second most popular party in Greece. They have a significant number of um, politicians in Parliament, and you can go and look at the pictures and see them doing Nazi salutes in Parliament. It's frightening. It's a, it's an econo it's a society in meltdown. Um, Spain. Greece, Spain is an, an even more interesting example, because until the crisis, Spain had a better record of budget deficits than Germany. So Spain is an even clearer example that the crisis was not caused by a profligate state spending too much. It was caused by bank failure, massive failure of the financial system, massive speculation, a, specula a casino economy that had been run in the interest of the few for a long time. And then the banks went down and all of a sudden the free market doesn't apply anymore and the public bails out the banks and the public has to bear the price through horrendous cuts that I know Yolanda is going to talk about. I was just reading on the train this morning in Ireland where there's serious austerity. It's, it's a field day now in Ireland for vulture funds, for big private, the people I was talking about making 25 and 30% who are now buying up 
the Irish economy. They're coming in and they're buying up at fire sale, fire sale prices the distressed debt, the debt of homeowners, the debt of the banks, the debt of the country, the property of, the, the, that people are being evicted from. So in a way, the crisis, which should have been our opportunity to really question this model, is being used in order to further perpetuate and make even more extreme this uh, system of, of greed. Um, and it isn't just, of course, it's not just um, confined to Europe. It's confined to many countries in the, in the developing world as well. So Mozambique. I don't know if people have been reading in the papers recently, but Africa is apparently experiencing some kind of miracle at the moment, miracle growth. Everyone wants to invest in Africa. That's because they don't want to invest in, in Europe. So they're investing in Africa, and this is supposed to be great, great news, and I'm sure in some cases it is. But actually, let's look at Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique, despite massive investment and high rates of growth, is also witnessing high, uh, increasing poverty rates. So that means massive inequality in the sort of growth that they're experiencing. It's, this, it's expected to be soon spending as much on foreign debt payments as before the debt crisis of the 1980s. We campaigned for many years for debt relief, uh, debt cancellation in Mozambique. The debt levels will soon be up to that level, again, despite very high levels of growth. And I think that's because of the type of... We've got to almost change what we mean by development today. Um, what's called development in our newspapers is not anything that I would call development. It's certainly making money, it's making wealth, it's generating profits. But is it actually making people's lives better? That's a very, very different question. And I think in many of these African countries, what you're actually going to experience is massive rates of inequality um, for uh, decades to come if we don't change what we really mean by, um, by development. So, finally, finally, is there an alternative? I kind of ran out of time last night on the PowerPoint so I don't think that Ecuador is the only alternative in the world, but this is the only slide I've got. So we'll leave President Correa up there. I think there are, of course, there are alternatives. But I also think, and the alternatives, I look to Latin America because there are very interesting things happening there. I studied um, Latin American politics back in university a long time ago, uh, 15, 16 years ago. And I had a, a, a teacher who was friends with all of the presidents at the time. It was kind of post-dictatorship for most American countries. Um, and there were democracies, but very, very neoliberal democracies. And the teacher I had was friends with all of these people in power, and he used to tell us about going to dinner with whatever president, whatever. And I thought, that sounds like a horrendous part of the world. I mean, really, I can't imagine any kind of progressive change coming from there at all. It really just sounded like people had been beaten down by years of dictatorship and had now accepted this form of democracy that had been given to them. And, well, what can you do about it? It's better than what we had before. I could not have imagined at that time that what was to come out of Latin America was the biggest challenge to the, this form of globalization that we've seen over the last 30 years that, that has ever been, that, that we've witnessed during that whole 30 years. Uh, in Ecuador, yes, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, but even in Argentina and Brazil, strong, strong social movements, campaign groups, uh, landless people, anti-privatization groups, um, mobilizing, getting together, talking about what kind of economy they wanted. And yes, getting people like Correa elected, people like Evo Morales in um, Bolivia, who have then gone on to make incredible changes. Um, so for example, you know, parla um, participatory budget budgets at all different levels of, of, of councils that involve thousands of people in deciding how they were going to spend their money on a local, le on a local level. Uh, Correa um, working to try and keep oil in the ground to stop burning our planet in Ecuador and finding ways that countries that are rich in oil can get some recompense for the fact that rather than spending and burning their oil, um, they're actually keeping it in the ground to keep the planet in a better state. Um, a real renewal of democracy. Um, across the continent. Um, absolutely phenomenal statistics on poverty alleviation in, um, in these countries. Um, so for example, poverty rate was halved in Venezuela in 10 years. Extreme poverty fell by 72%. Um, uh, poverty, um, again, halved in Ecuador. Um, phenomenal, you know, we talk about the Millennium Development Goals and how we're going to get there. And you think, well, if we really wanted to reach the Millennium Development Goals, a group of states in Latin America have actually really done very, very well indeed in terms of human development indicators, yet we don't look at what they're, do I mean, the, what, what they're doing, the kind of economic policies they're following are anathema 
to us. Um, so I think that this is a this is a very interesting challenge. They're forming they're, they've broken away from the International Monetary Fund. They're forming their own monetary fund to try and develop their region. They're, they say we don't want money from the World Bank. We're going to fund our own bank, a Bank of the South for a genuine form of development. They've got their own trading agreement. They've got their own currency to try and break from the dependency on the dollar so they don't keep supporting um, the indebtedness of America and American overconsumption. Uh, not everything they do is perfect, or I would agree with and probably not, neither would you agree with, but there is a real debate. There is an understanding that if we're to have a real democracy, a vibrant democracy, we must understand our economy and we must, as citizens, be able to make decisions about that economy. As President Lugo says, who unfortunately has been overthrown in a coup um, since this time. We are at a new moment in Latin America and we are the true authors of our own destiny. So um, it's interesting as well when I talk to campaigners in that part of the world and they moan about people like Correa and they say, oh, you're not going to guess what he's done now. He's done this and this and this has happened. And I say, well, it sounds, doesn't sound too bad to me. Um, but, they, but the point is to keep mobilised. The point is we did not elect a leader and then say, OK, we go home now and let that politician get on with it. We keep mobilised, we keep fighting for what we want at different, at different levels. Um, just a couple of examples of one is for why I've got Correa up here is for me from the debt movement he's very exciting because he organised an audit of his country's debt. Most of it had been run up by the military junta in the 1970s and it was still costing the country a fortune. Um, they weren't able to spend what they wanted on health and education and that kind of thing. And he said, no, 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 my debt is to the people of my country. So we're going to look at this debt and see whether we think it's legitimate and should be paid or not. And he decided, he set up an independent audit and the independent audit came back and said it's not legitimate and we think it's done enormous harm to our country. We don't think it should be paid. And so he defaulted on a certain amount of that debt and wiped it out and um, has increased social spending as a result of that um, by an enormous amount. He's made sure the money he saved not paying that debt actually goes on um, supporting development within his um, within his economy. And there's lots of other examples. I won't, I won't um, go into them all, but we can talk about it more. There are real alternatives. And it's not just Latin America. It's in lots of other parts of the world as well. Um, and Yolanda, I think, in her, in her um, meeting is going to give some, some interesting talks about what's happening in Spain and how people are getting occupied there. But I don't think people look today at these countries and think, well, that would be, that would be great, but, you know, we're in Europe, so what can we do about it? Uh, I, I think... What's happened in Europe is so profound, it's such a profound crisis and, and possibly I know people are going through real hardship and suffering here in the UK but um, we're still nowhere near um, southern Europe, whether we will be or not I, I don't know, but our continent really is in a, in a state of social disintegration and um, this is the time, it's like John said, it, we have to know about it but we also have to take it as an opportunity because if we don't take this opportunity to change the way, to change the morality, the ethics behind our economy, to rejuvenate our politics and our economy and so on, then we're never going to get the chance again. And that's why we're involved in this, in this project, which, as I said, is to, is to stop talking about this specific campaign or this specific campaign. Yes, we're going to keep doing that. But to think more, as a group of campaign organisations, we're in a privileged position to be paid to help people think and organise. How can we do that more effectively? How can we better respond to movements in the UK? How can we say to different sorts of activists, look, there's a common link here and we've got to work together and see this as a global problem. So that's why today we've tried to bring together anti-cuts activists working on this country with global activists interested in third world issues to say how can we more effectively challenge this horrendous form of global economy which has caused suffering to billions of people over the last 30 years and reclaim that economy for ourselves, for something saner and for something that meets the needs of ordinary people, reduces poverty and inequality and so on. So um, that's a long talk from me. I think we were going to break into groups, but I think we're not. Oh, you're going you're gonna to say what's going to happen next. Thank you. First, thank you, Nick.